Hi, my name is Bob Grunia and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. In this, the third part of the Natural Plasma Balls and Lena Low Energy Nuclear Reactions on Fireball Phenomena in Histalin, Norway, I want to discuss the findings or a couple of the principal findings of the Italian research that was conducted in 2002. The things that I'm interested in here are that they found increased radiation and iron-rich spheres. So on the subject of radiation, the research team selected powder samples that appeared to be near where Norwegian witnesses had seen a big light ball in previous months. They chose samples from the interest zone that appeared to present a Geiger tube radiation count two to five times that of background. These were analysed by Dr Stefano Moretti in Emola. So in the samples they found zirconium silicate and suggested that this might be a source of the radiation. Uh, and essentially that's because uh, zirconium contains 93 uh, zirconium. It's kind of like a trace uh, part of zirconium. It also contains 96. Now 96 has a long half-life, which is a double beta decay. So maybe we can pull that up, isotopes of zirconium. So if we go down to 96 here, uh, that is... Uh, to, uh, 20 times 10 to the 18 years and uh, decays to 96 molybdenum and that's a double beta decay and if something is in bold on these isotope tables the half-life is longer than the life of the universe so essentially on, on, on a normal circumstances you will never see this happen um, uh, pretty much but uh, if you look at uh, 93 uh, zirconium uh, uh, that has 1.53 times 10 to the 6 years. Uh, so that is uh, much shorter or shorter than the life of the universe. And uh, that's a beta minus 293 niobium. Okay, so that for me is the one that's interesting from a, um, a decay point of view. Because uh, my understanding that is if you have an EVO and it's synthesizing elements uh, and it's fusing and fusing and so forth, that if it was to produce some zirconium and then the process was interrupted, uh, then uh, it would maybe have uh, some uh, isotopes that are not uh, uh, radio remediated so they're, they're still um, radioactive so in, in my view this is why uh, uh, Lena produces tritium because if you look at the uh, say the curve that, of isotopes that you get out of say Norris Peary's work or, or uh, Adamenko's work they are like stellar uh, distribution but of course you have a lot of uh, uh, nuclei down at the bottom end and uh, if you go <laughs> one nucleon two nucleon deuterium three nucleons uh, uh, tritium obviously tritium would be uh, up, up in the high in uh, uh, incidence if you were having something that was doing some synthesis and and then uh, broke uh, you'd have a, a lot of that uh, left over so um, that's one potential hypothesis for how uh, radioactive isotopes can come out of a system that hasn't sort of burnt its way to the end in a sort of stable state but been interrupted. So, uh, but for me, the other interesting thing is that the MFMP has observed uh, production of zirconium in at least two Lena systems it has investigated. The echo system part processed fuel and specific ash ejections from two consecutive Lion experiments. Uh, this was discussed at length in uh, uh, this blog post, which you can go to. Uh, and it's uh, believed by this author that the production of zirconium, as well as its precursor calcium, is a major signature of low-energy nuclear reactions. Uh, for instance, in the case of Parkamov's 225-day reactor, there were massive amounts of calcium. Now, when you get the blog, you will be able to look at all of these references from these links that are provided. Now, Bolotov, uh, who I discussed in a previous uh, blog post, he uh, showed that how zirconium uh, oxide, ZrO2, was formed from uh, two calcium oxides uh, fusing, two times calcium oxide. And uh, we discussed this again in a, a previous blog post. So, it, giving you an example here, in a larger structure in uh, the Lion 1 reactor, we found a slug of material containing a high concentration of both calcium and oxygen in addition to carbon. So if I uh, press this, maybe we will get the response. And uh, 
So there's two uh, parts to this. And one of them you can see has got calcium and oxygen, and the other one has basically no calcium and is just copper and oxygen. So it's, uh, that's the uh, two individual sort of uh, analysis there. And you can see, uh, if I go back here, uh, this, this one here is the one that's uh, synthesized the calcium and so forth. So um, now the lion core is carbon loaded with D2O. D will not be detected by energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, EDS. Some fusion pathways are as follows. So I'm giving a sort of suggestion here. Basically, two carbons fuse to yield magnesium, oxygen fusing uh, with magnesium to produce calcium, and calcium fusing with calcium to produce zirconium. So we saw the calcium uh, being synthesized in this part, and then that can go through. Uh, and in fact, uh, there is a small problem with this, that the um, most abundant isotopes of carbon and oxygen, they do not have enough uh, neutrons, uh, so it may be necessary to breed neutron-rich oxygen from multibody fusion of carbon and 2D, so that's, uh, uh, you know, two deutrons. Uh, so it goes uh, C and O, but uh, you're, you're getting some, uh, uh, you know, 18 oxygen in there. Um, or to have some neutron production in the process in order to give a uh, full spread of calcium isotopes. Uh, Dr. Alexander Parkamov is very aware of the limitations of this first basic, though valuable, data set he generated where these are coming from. So if I take the calcium with, fusing with calcium producing zirconium here, and uh, we have that here. Uh, so calcium, calcium producing zirconium. Uh, he's not including uh, production of 93 or 96 uh, because, as I said, um, they are uh, uh, radioactive and so it's only stable to stable in his data set. And in this data set, um, he didn't include electron processes, but he has now uh, looked at uh, inverse beta processes uh, driven by cold neutrinos. And this will be a subject of uh, a forthcoming video. So note, Alexander Parkamov's data does not include the unstable nuclei and is therefore the, the reaction of 48 to 48 cal uh, calcium to 96 zirconium is missing. Uh, in any case, uh, with fusion of only natural isotopes of calcium, there is no way to observe 93 zirconium, which appears as trace in nature. However, when considering Bolotov's approached re proposed reaction chain, it can be synthesized. The beta decay of 93 zirconium uh, leads to the production of 93 niobium, uh, and uh, there were high concentrations of niobium uh, found in the echo fuel. So if we can maybe pull that up uh, here. And so, yeah, that's... So this is the uh, reactor that was used uh, in echo and uh, uh, to produce the fuel. And here's uh, some of the uh, fuel here. And if you look, there's 9.1% by weight of uh, zirconium. And down here, there's 3.5% by weight of niobium. So um, there was a synthesis of uh, niobium, it would seem. So again, we have niobium, 2.2%, niobium, 3.2%, niobium, 3.8%, niobium, 3.4%. And again, zirconium. So there seems to be uh, quite a, a large, uh, much more zirconium in there. What I've done here is I've like, like assumed that the, the 90, 91, 92, 94, 96 have been synthesized from calcium. And then I'm saying that uh, by uh, fusing with two oxygens in a, in, in a multinuclei uh, reaction, uh, you are getting production of 93 zirconium. So I, I give several uh, reactions here that may be possible to produce 93 uh, zirconium. And and so I, I chose this because it was a simplification of uh, Bolotov's proposed reaction. So I am saying here, though, that uh, it may be that the zirconium silicate that was observed, ZrSiO4, is synthesized when ball lightning hits the ground through the interaction with tremolite, which was recovered from nearby ground samples. So they had area where they had this uh, 2 to 5 or whatever it was increased in radiation and nearby samples where they found this tremolite. And tremolite is actually calcium 2, silicon 8 and oxygen 22, OH2. OK, so you have the calcium and the oxygen in order to synthesize your zirconium oxide. 
And you also have silicon here and uh, oxygen to form your silicon uh, uh, SiO4. So zirconium silicate with something that is a, a highly active Lena uh, system colliding into tremolite might actually be able to synthesize the zirconium. And as it was colliding in, it's, it's not only um, uh, doing the transmutation, it's, uh, it's also losing its electrons into the ground and dissipating and going through an impedance mismatch. And so it's uh, potentially being cut short in, in the transmutation process. So there might be more um, nine, 93 and 96 synthesized than otherwise would be found in nature. And maybe over time it would sit there with latent um, uh, evos that are left over and, 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 and do their business and you would end up with something that was more natural over a period of time. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is iron-rich spheres. Now, in the target powder samples only, they found a perfectly spheroidal iron particle with dimensions of about 20 micrometers in diameter, which they said is highly unusual, or unusual rather, in nature. And here's a look at that, and you can see that this has this sort of uh, crenellated structure here uh, all, all over it. There's the spherical nature of it, and you can see here it's a 10 micron scale, so 20 microns is a fair uh, call on the size. And now I want to refer to the fact that this kind of crenellated uh, iron uh, sphere uh, is something that we have observed of. This highly magnetic kind of uh, uh, material uh, is found in a range of different Lena systems. And actually, the MFMP has observed formation of spheres in recent years in many analyzed experiments. During a question and answer session following AR Bik Mukhamatova's 25th uh, Sochi cold nuclear transportation and ball lightning presentation on natural and artificial long-lived luminescent objects in the atmosphere, this author, that's me, uh, produced a slide showing evidence of the production of highly magnetic iron-rich spheres from Lenner experiments and other sources, including plasmatic processes at, and atmospheric events such as that which occurred in Tunguska in 1908, where nickel-rich magnetite spheres were observed. Okay, so there's references there that you can go and uh, check. But here is that slide. And essentially, there's a couple of points here. There's the, there's the first one, which is in crop circles uh, and... Uh, this is a the top of a head of corn, and there are these iron spheres uh, on there, and they are uh, magnetic and uh, uh, forming this kind of arrangement. Now, it's interesting because uh, some supposedly real <laughs> crop circles, they have these, uh, um, sometimes they say that they see these uh, balls of light um, doing, you know, operating on the field before the crop circle occurs. So uh, you, you have balls of light and magnetic uh, uh, spheres. This is on the outside of the quartz uh, uh, in the Lion uh, 2 reactor. So here is the quartz. And uh, there is a series of these uh, magnetic balls sticking together very similarly like this one. And in fact, this ball is like it, it would appear to be half in the quartz and half out. So it's kind of like came into our space time, like but just happened to be on the boundary. Uh, it kind of came out and then it, there's more of these balls somehow deposited on the outside of, of the reactor and highly magnetic. In the Nova Basic uh, reactor, again, uh, we have these uh, uh, spheres. This is very large, and I'll show you that uh, a little bit later. So crop circle samples, Lion 2 and Nova Basic analysis show static electric fields and, and high magnetic spheres. Um, uh, spheres were also found in wood inside trees at the site of the Tunguska event. So uh, I just want to, and there's a, I think we've got a link to that uh, there. Now, the magnetic spheres from Lion 2 have yet to be put under the high magnification. Uh, the largest of the Nova spheres was 500 microns across, so very much larger than this uh, 20 micron. But um, it, this one here is, is 500 microns across. But of course, there are a lot more. You can see them sticking on here and sticking on here. The NOVA is a microwave-based plasma reactor developed by Dr. George Eagley, a world expert in ball lightning, that started in uh, this case predominantly with carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and silicon in the active area. So um, there are two areas here. There's this area here, which is a blobby-type silicon, and these uh, crenellated spheres. 
Uh, interestingly, it would appear that there's a kind of like a magnetic pole here. And uh, this looks like a, an Ultima Thule that's kind of nearly coming together, but hasn't quite come together. But we've got, we've got other things down here that look like a Ultima Thule here, like this this one here, uh, agglomeration, and this agglomeration here, but uh, it's just a, a visual recognition there. But it, it, it kind of looks like the poles are, are running through this way uh, on, on these spheres. And uh, uh, the crenellations look a lot smaller on this because, of course, uh, this one, even this one's like 200 and whatever, 220 or 200 microns across, whereas uh, it's, that's 10 times larger than, than this one. Uh, but if you actually look at the constitution of it, and we've got uh, spectrum 2 here on that and spectrum 1 on the gl globby uh, silicon type one, the, the globby one is like lots of different elements, uh, but the uh, uh, spectrum 2, which is on the crenellated ball, uh, is oxygen mostly and iron. So when you actually do the numbers, uh, it comes out at Fe to O ratio on the surface of 1 to 2.1. And I'm saying that using a weight to atom converter, we get that ratio uh, and compensating for the other elements in that one. And so, however, the ferromagnetic nature of the particles, uh, they stick together by themselves, as can be seen in the SEM, uh, suggests that they are uh, either maghemite uh, or uh, magnetite. So this kind of aligns with the observations of finding uh, uh, magnetite, I, I think it was, uh, yeah, magnetite in the Tunguska event. And perhaps these also are magnetite, and these are also magnetite. Um, so, but certainly they are expressing, uh, or appear to be expressing magnetism. And that's not the only researcher and, and areas that have observed these kind of uh, spheres, these crenellated spheres. Here's one uh, that was sent uh, to me in late 2016 by uh, the Lena researcher Me356. And here it is, we have a sphere, and it's crenellated, and so forth. So um, the, other, the other thing that's interesting on this one, which you may be able to see, is there appears to be a polar pinching here. So it's sort of, everything's sort of coming out from this pole, and it seems to be fairly smooth here. So maybe there's some uh, relationship with how it formed there. Maybe there's some sort of relationship with magnetism. I don't know. Um, unfortunately, we don't know what this is. Uh, it... Um, you know, what, what are we looking at here? Is is this carbon or some element in that kind of range? If it is, then this is potentially could be iron. I don't know, um, based on the fact that it tends to uh, show lighter if it's a heavier element. Um, but we don't know because he didn't have a EDS at the time of getting this sample uh, sent over. So I'm saying here... Um, an image search on the term iron nanospheres revealed similar structure claimed to be 2.7 billion years old micrometeorite due to knowing the age of the limestone it was present in. So I'm just going to go to this news article. They call it Space Dust, oldest meteorites ever found to show Earth's atmosphere was surprisingly rich in oxygen 2.7 billion years ago. And there is the... Maybe I can... There we go. Look at that. You can see that uh, this uh, looks quite similar. It's uh, not quite the same... Um, but uh, it's a sphere and it has this crenellated structure. Uh, however, this author suggests that is a conclusion that cannot be drawn because of the apparent ability of EVOs to not only synthesize iron-rich crenellated spheres, but also to kind of teleport themselves and their payload into other places and materials, particularly into the ground, which will be the subject of future blog posts. So essentially, uh, an EVO can become uh, neutral, uh, like a neutron, and it can go into the ground. But it, uh, before it becomes neutral, it may be traveling at a velocity and uh, 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 based on the field between the, the lightning cloud and the ground, or just the uh, lithosphere and the uh, lithosphere and the ionosphere, or just, just some potential difference that's causing it to travel into the ground. And so I'm saying even if there was no payload in the EVO cluster resulting from the lightning or other source, uh, the EVO could have gone into the ground in its black state, this is where it has expresses no charge, and been excited at some depth, transmuting directly the limestone. Limestone is calcium carbonate, CaCO3, uh, in 1994, published in the fusion technology. R. Sundarasan and J. Bokris at Texas A&M University, they replicated George Oshawa uh, carbon electrodes underwater experiment, seeing the production of iron, suggesting the reaction was uh, 2 carbon plus 18 oxygen goes to 56 iron plus 4 helium. Uh, in addition, 
there are 16 very net positive nucleon exchange reactions starting with oxygen and calcium that yield isotopes of iron. So if I click on that, you can see here we're starting with oxygen and calcium, which is in calcium carbonate, uh, and you end up with helium and iron. Now, my view is that you don't see the helium because the helium is actually an alpha when it's in uh, the EVO, and the alpha can go on to actually form elements that you already have in there. Like, um, So, for instance, uh, you you don't observe the 4-helium because it may be due to uh, it being produced as alpha inside the EVO as it's doing its work. It goes on to make more 12C, triple alpha, or 16 oxygen, quad alpha. And so it is suspected that the spheres found in Australia were synthesized terrestrially in a similar way to the Hestalen sphere and not micrometeorites of extraterrestrial origin. Some calcium carbonate was purchased in 2017 with a view to testing with carbon in Nova reactors. If an increased yield of iron is observed, it may provide strong evidence of this reaction path. And so I'm just suggesting here at the end, why don't you do an image search on the same keywords? Those are uh, iron nanospheres and see what you can find. So just something for you to have a look at. So thank you for watching this third part of this video on the Hestalen light phenomena. Um, and I will do the discussion inclusions in the next video.